Okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, so one of the ways to circumvent the issue of heat loss or heat gain when the when the apparatus setup of your experiment, heat heat uh, related experiment is something different than the ambient temperature, is to do the same error twice, and then mathematically we can eliminate that error from our calculation volume. So that's a pretty smart way to deal with the what this this kind of error. So that's what I've seen in our last class for this question. What was this question? Mm, this one. That here we could see that when the heater was being blown, the mass evaporation that happened in five minutes for a 50 watt heater it was 6.5 gram. For a 70 watt heater, it was 13.6 gram. So within this, within both of this routine, we had the heat lost the surrounding. Because in this case, the experiment was supposed to be higher than the room temperature. Because as, as the question says, that energy is supplied at a constant rate to the heater. <laughs> when the liquid is boiling at a constant rate, the mass of the liquid you have brought in five minutes is measured. The part of the heater is then changed. And then the procedure is repeated. Data for the two power ratings are given in the previous event. So which means for this experiment to work out, our apparatus setup was supposed to, main, supposed to be maintained at 100 degrees Celsius. <coughs> so it, it lost it to the surrounding. Experiment for two different power, power, Bolo. Sir? Bolo. Didn't we complete this last class? Yes, we did. I'm trying to give a bit, bit, bit of a recap. <laughs> so we we can find out the difference of these two things which can give us the exact value of the power used for the heat up of the water that so we can circumvent the issue of the power loss so that's one that was one thing the other thing that we did discuss in our last class which was a similar problem so we went a bit bit far ahead directly which was uh, this problem so this is a problem where the apparatus setup is cooler than the atmosphere. So heat is supposed to get in uh, because we are working with uh, crushed ice. And here we have done this experiment by heater switched off once and then we have done the heater switched on. So if we look over here, whenever we have done the experiment with heater switched off, the water was still dripping out because the heat could heat was again from the atmosphere as well. So we had to wait for the water drop rate to become uniform. So you have to observe the dripping rate to become nearly uniform. And then the energy supplied to the heater is zero because by our calculation, we kept the heater switched off, which means no energy was being supplied whatsoever. <sighs> so no, no energy was being supplied and then uh, so it was zero and the time interval was 10.0. So what for this experiment, the heater switched off amount of heat. I mean, the heat energy gained from the surrounding to make the uh, melting process possible was measured for 10 minutes. Now we wonder why 10 minutes? Because we would like to get a bigger amount of water, preferably, so that our error is less. <laughs> so we measured the uh, uh, ambient heating for 10 minutes. Then we switched on the heater so, and we, uh, 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 we operated it for five minutes. So with the, the heater was made on for five minutes. And then we had this amount of mass of water from the sound. Now important bit for you to understand that these two time intervals are not same. To be able to subtract these values, Either you have to convert both of these information for 10 minutes or you have to convert both of them into two, five minutes and then do the relevant time amount for your actual energy supplied. So that's important for this part. So if the time intervals are given in different values, somehow you have to make them equal so that you could do subtraction between the numbers for the two rows. That's an important bit for this information. This one math was not very difficult, the similar procedure. The other thing that I wanted to talk about I said, this is actually a good table to fill out. We're gonna see about that in a bit. No, don't worry. 
And the other thing that I wanted to talk about was this one. Sir, the question is Mars Kim has a problem. Mars Kim has a lot of questions. Mars Kim can be difficult. I mean, I can have a problem with the aluminum block. I was talking about this one. I'm going to solve this problem, which, we, which I discussed in the last class for, for our class. And I'm going to try to make it a, uh, uh, show you the calculation for this question as well. So let's have a look. This question Sir, said, Sir, agar question ta to just amra five minutes sir value ta ni bo. Mane duita table theke. Tar pore calculation korbo. You could do either. You could uh, make the five minutes into ten minutes, or you can go could convert the ten minutes into five minutes. Ota to sir unitary method diye normally jeta kore shetei. Ena sir. Divided by two or multiplied by two. Where did the unitary method come from? Sir, I mean, the table that you just normal maths in use for it, or just five minutes, but ten minutes, so that I mean, energy ni bo. And ekolo trick to nai na, sir. You have to multiply by two if you want to use ten minutes for both of them, or if you have to divide by two if you have to you want to use five minutes for both of them. That's the trick. Okay, I <laughs> All right. So <laughs> for option just B, what we have, let's have a look over here. A thermometer and analytic heater are inserted into two holes of aluminum block of mass 960 gram, as well as 3.1. So we put these two things over here, and then the power rating of the heater is 54 watt. The question goes further. <clears throat> the heater is switched on, and the readings on the temperature of the block are given at regular time intervals. When the block reaches a constant temperature, the heater is switched off, and then Further temperature readings are taken. The variation with time t of the temperature theta of the block is shown in figure 3.2. So this is the whole thing. And the temperature drops down like that. So this is why the rate of rise of temperature of the block decreases to zero. This is because the way this experiment was working is that <coughs> we provided heating to the aluminum block. <coughs> By taking heat from the uh, heater, the temperature of the aluminum block was slowly increasing, 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 increasing. As the temperature of the block was slowly increasing further, its gain of temperature was slowly going to become less and less and less because at that point, I mean, the far higher the temperature of the block is, the more rapidly it's going to uh, lose heat to the surrounding. The heat loss rate would be more, <coughs> uh, which is a logical thing, but I did not have, I, I could not find a mathematical model to explain this in behavior that why is it, uh, I mean, how does it work that if we have a bigger temperature difference, the rate of heat transfer would also be higher. Uh, I need to look that up, so I could not have an explanation for this. But this is how it works. As we are going to increase the temperature, then the rate of temperature increase will slowly decrease because the rate of heat loss is going to slowly increase. <clears throat> Eventually, at one point of the temperature, the rate of heat gain should become equal to the rate of heat loss, which should give us the horizontal part of this curve. So as per this question, when the graph reaches its horizontal part, at one point, we immediately switched off the power heater. So we switched off the electrical output. So whenever we switch off the electrical output, we are now no longer supplying a, a power, a heat energy, but heat is continuously going out of the system. Since heat is continuously going out of the system, since heat is, heat is continuously going out of the system, so the temperature is gonna start falling. That's why, that's, the, that's what this corner represents. So if I, if I take out this question from all of here, let's say, uh, Select it. Oh, I cannot select it as a whole. It's a bit of a shame. All right. <laughs> so this 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 graph shows us the variation with the temperature versus time graph uh, as it's going downwards. So this is why the rate of rise so is why the rate of rise of temperature of the block decreases to zero. So this part is pretty simple because at the highest point or the peak point of the temperature versus time graph graph, the rate of heat gain <laughs> becomes equal to the rate of heat loss because the temperature of the aluminum block has reached to a very high value. Since no more energy was absorbed by the heat uh, block anymore. That's where the temperature becomes temperature becomes constant. 
slash the temperature increase becomes zero have a look the question is not asking suggest why the why the uh, why the temperature is becoming zero this is why the rate of rise of temperature of the log decreases to zero so they are still asking why the gradient of this graph became zero because theta versus time would be the rate of rise of temperature <laughs> decreases to zero so this is a theoretical question which you can work 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 your way around not a big deal uh, if you go for this equation, which is the important bit, which I'm, I'm interested, let's take this out. All right, have a look. <laughs> After the heater has been switched off, the maximum rate of rate of fall of temperature is 32.7 Kelvin per minute. Estimate the specific capacity of aluminium. Try to understand this set piece of information with very, 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 very high amount of care. Try to understand this part very carefully. Have a look. After the heater has been switched off, the maximum rate of fall of temperature, maximum rate of fall of temperature is 3.7 Kelvin per minute. Estimate the specific heat capacity of aluminium. Have a look. The maximum rate of fall of temperature, which means the steepest part of the graph for the falling temperature part. Now, this would be essentially be available at the peak because you can see that if you have a good look at the shape of the graph, let me zoom in, you should be able to see that this graph is slowly losing gradient. And also logically, logically this graph will slowly become losing gradient and it, it, will, it, will, it will become asymptote to the room temperature as it's gonna slowly lose heat. That's how the uh, heat dissipation works. So the maximum rate of heat giving out was possible when the graph was the steepest, which means we are talking about to find out the gradient of this graph at a point somewhere exactly over here. So maybe something like this, or maybe a bit more higher gradient. A bit more. Yeah, something like that. So this is the gradient that gives us the maximum temperature versus time graph uh, as the object was cooling off. So we can essentially measure this up, that what is the delta theta by T for this point. Now, why is this calculation important for us? Because from this question, you are asked to calculate the specific capacity of the aluminum, which, which we can work out pretty well. So to understand how this, how this mathematical mathematics is gonna work out, from the graph, we can find out what would be the delta theta by T where when p out equals to 54 watt we're gonna be able to calculate this information from the graph first we appreciate this information see if this word makes sense everyone have a look so <laughs> The question says when the block reaches a constant temperature, the heater is switched off and then the further temperature readings are taken. So when the block reaches a constant temperature, that's when the block starts to cool off. And that's no, 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 that's when not when the glasses of block is cool off. When the block reaches a constant temperature, the graph becomes horizontal because the temperature is not increasing any further. The whole idea of constant temperature. Then as we switch off the heat, heat, heat source, heat supplied would become zero, but heat lost to the surrounding would still be available because the element block is still hot. So it's gonna start losing temperature, losing heat to the surrounding very vigorously at a pretty high rate. And this temperature is gonna to start to fall from that point onwards whenever we have switched off the electrical heaters. And that's where you get the maximum rate of heat loss. So you can measure all the individual temperature versus time graph for small time intervals and for plot all, all of these values. And eventually you can get a graph like that. That's how this, that's how this graph was generated in the first place. And then if we draw a tangent at this point, we can essentially find out what is the rate of heat loss. So what is the, we can calculate out from the graph, what is the temperature versus time graph gradient? So delta theta by T, because the gradient of theta, theta T graph would be delta theta by T. I should have also given delta theta by delta T, if that makes better sense for you, no big deal. So delta theta by delta T, this is the gradient of the graph. We can calculate this out. And that gradient, that gradient for that exact highest point would be applicable for P out equals to 54 watts because that's the whole idea of constant temperature. At the starting point of the, of the decreasing temperature, <laughs> at the starting point, your output heat was exactly equal to input heat. 
and the according to the question the input power heat power was operated at 54 watts so the statement that i just made from the graph we with appropriate drawing we can calculate out what is the delta theta by delta t value when p out is exactly 54 watt can we get this information sir p out is power lost to surrounding yes oh. everyone do you agree if you don't agree respond if you do agree respond say yes or no sir power loss is still 54 watt after we like switch off the heater in at that instant Oh, at that instant, at yeah, that yeah, yeah. instant of switching of the heater, power loss is 54 watt. The first. And then from that point onwards, the power loss will slowly become less and less and less. Oh, okay. And when, is that, when it is at the maximum temperature? Yes, at that instant, the power loss is 54 watt. Okay. Thank you. So I talked with three kids up, up till now. The rest of you, if you don't want to do class or if you don't want to respond, leave. If you don't want to use the voice channel, then then use the voice channel. If you don't, if you cannot or do not want to use the voice channel, write yes or no in the chat window. Do something. Yes, sir. Got it. Yes, sir. Got it. Enough, Abdul Rahman. If you're asking me questions, it's better to ask in the public window chat because that's appreciated. So, sir, I'm at the question. It to pour it. One of your friends just asked me a question, which you asked me privately. So, I'm gonna quote the question is that while the temperature increases, why doesn't the gradient remain constant? I mean, why does this graph slowly lose its gradient? I'll explain. Try to understand. Whenever we start applying heat to the block, whenever we start applying heat to the block, the temperature is going to slowly start to increase. So try to visualize this. Your atmosphere is still maintained at 20 degrees Celsius, which is the atmosphere temperature. But the aluminum block temperature slowly start going to increase from that value. So the temperature difference between your aluminum block and the atmosphere is going to slowly increase. The delta theta between the between an experimental object and the atmosphere is slowly going to increase. The, the temperature difference is that bigger the temperature difference is, the bigger will be the rate of heat loss. So, if your object is at a higher temperature, uh, at a significantly higher temperature than the atmosphere, you're going to lose heat really fast. If your object is at a lower temperature, but still I mean, small temperature higher than the atmosphere, 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 you're gonna lose heat. <laughs> you're still gonna lose it because your object is hotter than the atmosphere, but that amount would be less. So bigger temperature difference causes heat loss to be much faster and, uh, and smaller temperature difference uh, gives the, uh, makes the heat loss to be slower. That's why as the temperature goes higher and higher and higher, from that same aluminum block, you'll be losing heat much too faster. So if I give you some numerical colors, for example, let's say when the temperature was, let's say 25 degrees Celsius, <laughs> and it had just got started at, the, at this exit instant, the heater would give a fit for what? And all of the heat would be absorbed by the aluminum block. Then let's say over here, let's say the temperature over here is let's say uh, uh, 10 degrees Celsius because we don't have any scale over here. So I can assume it to be 10 degrees Celsius. So let's say at 10 degrees Celsius, <laughs> the heat loss to the surroundings was let's say three watts or five watts, for example. Five watts, why? <laughs> because here the temperature difference here, here, I mean, when the block is at, at, at not 10 degrees Celsius, 35 degrees Celsius, I meant. So if the block is at 35 degrees Celsius or the t t temperature difference between the block and the atmosphere is 10 degrees Celsius, for that small temperature, t temperature difference, <laughs> your block is not gonna lose a lot of heat from the, to the surrounding because the temperature gap is pretty small. So most of the heat applied to the block would be used up for its own heating. So its temperature is going to increase. Small portion, 
a significantly small portion of the heat will be would be would be dissipated to the surrounding <laughs> that's the important bit since a very small portion will be dissipated to the surrounding so that's why the temperature rise is going to be really rapid and as temperature rise is going to keep on keep on happening as the temperature rise is going to keep ha happening is going to start losing heat to the surrounding with more more higher rate for example let's say when the temperature of the <laughs> block will be let's say 40 degrees celsius you will be you might as well start losing heat to the surrounding at 15 degrees, 15 watt higher the temperature difference between the object and the uh, surrounding the more would be the rate of heat loss to the surrounding because the object will try to get back to equilibrium more strongly so we can calculate out this information so if we have this information then the calculation actually becomes much more simpler so i'm going to try to do it over here so here we are asked to estimate the estimate the specific capacity of aluminium so we can pretty well write the basic equation that uh, q equals to mc delta theta this is the basic equation that we know for uh, for what for specific capacity and i can i can divide the whole equation on both sides by delta theta so i can write q divided by delta theta should be equals to m c delta theta by delta t and if you wonder why am I writing it in this fashion? The reason I'm writing it in this fashion is because from the graph, I could calculate out this value. And this is the power. Energy over time gives you the power. So now you start place all the values over here and go ahead and do the calculation. This is supposed to be 54 watt. As per the quotient, the value is given. What is the mass of the block? Nine hundred sixty gram mass of the block was given, so we can write zero point nine six over here into C into three point seven divided by sixty. Check this out. Why divided by sixty? <coughs> Where did this come from? Bolo one. Per minute, yes, sir. Per minute. Yes. Per minute, sir. Temperature drop per minute. So you place all the values. You calculate out the value of C. C. So this is another way to circumvent the problem of the heat loss. So here, what they did over here, they practically used the entire idea of heat loss to do the experiment. So they raised the temperature to such a high value that uh, that the heat loss would become equal to the uh, heat. Now, if you wonder that, wouldn't this cost a lot of energy? Isn't this going to be energy inefficient? The answer is yes, definitely. But it actually allows us to do the experiment pretty, pretty accurately. And how much energy are we going to lose? Or how long is it going to take for, the, for this equilibrium to be reached? For this equilibrium to be reached? Well, yeah, for this, for this equilibrium to be reached, for, which means the graph to become nearly horizontal. <laughs> nearly not, exactly horizontal is highly dependent upon how well conductive this uh, this metal, metal block is and how much heater how, how how powerful of a heater are we using for example this experiment is never going to work out if you are trying to do this experiment using a glass block <laughs> because glass block would be a poor conductor of heat for a metal piece you can pretty much assume that the temperature of the metal block is the same everywhere close to your heater anywhere in between, anywhere inside, on the surface, everywhere the temperature is nearly equal at the equilibrium point because metals are good conductors of heat that you can assume that you can work with. But if it's a glass block or if it's a plastic block or a rubber block or a polymer substance, you cannot use that assumption. Heat, heat temperature around the heater will always be higher and as you slowly get away from the heater, heater, heater location, your temperature is gonna slowly be lower. There'll be a localized temperature gradient in this case mean uh, gradual change so that's why that that procedure i mean that might not be applicable for sir, you know, you know. i think not it's fine on my network 
আচ্ছা সো এটা হচ্ছে একটা ইম্পর্টেন্ট বিষয় সো দিস ইজ দিস এক্সেপশন মেন ইজ নট ইউনিভার্সাল ফর অল দ্য অপারেটরস বাট দিস ইজ ইন মাই অপিনিয়ন অ্যাজ ফার এজ আই এম অন কনসার্ন অ্যাজ ফার এজ আই আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড দ্যাট দিস ইজ ভেরি মাচ পসিবল ফর মেটাল ব্লকস বিকজ ওনলি ফর মেটাল ব্লকস ইউ ক্যান অ্যাজিউম দ্য এন্টায়ার ব্লক টু হ্যাভ দ্য সেম এক্স টেম্পারেচার অল ওভার ইট বাট ফর নরমেটালিক সাবস্টেন্সেস দিস মাইট নট ওয়ার্ক আউট ওকে আই উইল টেক क्वेश्चंस फ्रॉम यू वन बाय वन अबियस or uh, sir for any case on a temperature against time graph uh, will there be any constant gradient or will it always be changing so will it be like fully curved or will there any be any straight line segment well uh, if you have temperature time graph and your temperature is actually changing uh, logic implies that we will always have variation of temperature so your graph should always have a changing gradient if you slowly keep on increasing temperature or if you slowly change uh, go ahead and uh, decrease the temperature but uh, just to entertain your answer i mean i can give you one simple example in our o levels we learned for the parachutist graph that the first couple of seconds the air resistance was considered to be negligible remember I'll yes again yeah for the, for the parachute is graph we assume when the parachute makes that jump for the first 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 few seconds the air resistance was considered negligible and the graph was defined to be a straight line beyond a uh, couple of being beyond a certain point of time after the jump was happening the air resistance become significant enough and the graph actually started to curve out and eventually it curved to horizontal where the terminal velocity was reached before the parachute was open and blah 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 and goes far down from this point we assume the air resistance was negligible which doesn't mean the air resistance was zero which means for that part of the graph we are, we considered the air resistance value is too small to be considered so the question that you are asking that would it be always gradient the answer is yes uh, can we consider certain part of the graph as a straight line practically also yes i asked this question sir because like uh, the graph shown in the question uh, a part of it looks uh, straight that's why yeah yeah that's what i'm saying that for the <clears throat> for the initial part for a certain initial part you can consider it to be straight line i mean uh if you try to draw a tangent over here small segments of this part where the change of gradient is too small you can pretty much define it to be a straight line but whenever the temperature gradient becomes significantly curvature i mean you cannot consider it to be straight line. so what i can say that i mean what i can what we can say for this scenario is that for the starting part for a small time duration the actual heat loss was practically zero but it is not actually zero <laughs> practically zero means the heat loss was happening but if that temperature that rate of heat loss can be considered to be negligible we can do that for a initial certain amount of time as an approximation sir yeah as it's an approximation so it's not that's why i say that's why is used in the time that for practical purposes we can consider it the heat loss was zero but theoretically or actually realistically it's not actually zero heat loss does happen but that amount can be considered to be zero for the when the temperature difference is really small okay sir thank you sure. sajid sir i am using the calculation part of the question sir sure, go ahead the calculation part of the del theta ko hatte kaise sir it uh, this is the formula for a specific capacity do you remember this what about you what about the second line it oh acha 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 i get it i get it which is but this is an important i mean the reason i i wanted to show you this problem is to give you an idea that how what are the different ways that we can circumvent the problem of heat loss to the surrounding and everything so that's the important uh, important aspect that you need to understand uh, sir how, how does this thing work yes rafid sir can you repeat is amra keno water king ba kono fluid er jonno ei process ta repeat korte parbo na mane why can't we use that for water king for, for fluid yeah. we can for a fluid that is not working at its boiling temperature we can but you have to make sure that the evaporation is not really rapid because i mean let's say if you use it for a, for an amount of fluid go yellow yeah for a fluid you can use it how can you use it for the fluid well obviously for the fluid you have to keep it at some container 
and then you can close off the top altogether to stop evaporation altogether. So there'll be a small bit of evaporation happening from this thing, which you have to consider negligible because you cannot stop it altogether. And then you have to make sure that it is not undergoing at boiling state. So yeah, the heater should be taking it to a certain value of temperature. For a fluid, you can consider, you can use this expression because for a fluid, you can pretty much assume that there'll be conversion current and the temperature would be equal all over the fluid. That is something that you can do. But for solid substances, which are poor conductors of heat, you cannot apply this experiment. Because for those kind of scenarios like glass, plastic, or polymeric substances, the, temper the heat energy would not be dissipated as efficiently or as uh, well from the heater to the surrounding. For every part of the object, there would not be the same temperature. So this is most efficient for metal metallic objects and also for fluids as well as long as you don't operate them at boiling temperature okay sir i mean bottom line uh, i mean the i mean what is the what is the underlying principle for me to state this the underlying principle is that we need to make sure that the heat energy is supplied uniformly over the entire thing so if your heat energy supply, heat energy is not supplied all over the object efficiently, then we cannot assume the whole object to have the same temperature. That's the problem. So if you say a metal piece, you have good connection. If it is not a metal piece, if it's a fluid, you can, you can have good, uh, good convection. But if it's a poor conductor, then you have broad trouble. <laughs> all right, we'll get back to the question from which actually I made those jumps. So I believe, We were here, this one? Yes, this one. Uh, question number uh, seven, I can problem us anyone? <clears throat> I hope not. Eight, anyone really have any question relevant to eight? Sir, eight, they ask the A. My answer to me is Achal, help. Question number eight, the Some gas initial temperature at 27.2 degrees Celsius is heated so that its temperature rises to 30.8 degrees Celsius, calculate in Kelvin to an appropriate number of decimal places, the initial temperature of the gas. Now, whenever they say calculate it to the initial number, appropriate number of decimal places, we might also have to consider, I mean, this is a case where I can talk about a 273.16 short course, Sir? AJ. You could not add only 273. Because they gave the answer to one decimal place. <clears throat> so you need to add 273.15 Kelvin or 272 uh, or 273.2 Kelvin. So you have to bring about this 0.2 Kelvin over here as well. That's so that your final temperature should be 300.4 Kelvin. So this is the part, I mean, this is, I mean, in, in one of your earlier, earlier question, I told you that there are certain cases uh, in the thermal chapter and also in the nuclear chapter where you have to, you might have to use data that is more than three SF, and they have to. I might have to uh, write answer that is more than three SF because the reason uh, that I, I told you this. I mean, the reason we have to use two decimal places because the temperatures were measured up to two decimal places for the degree Celsius value over here and over also over here. So if you're trying to add something, you might as well add to the same precision value of this temperature as well. So this is addition, not uh, multiplication or division. So. Uh, it's not gonna work out more like SF, it's gonna work out more like DP. So 27.2 degrees Celsius plus 273.15 uh, or 273.2. So you have to use that 5SF or 4SF value for the equivalent temperature, Kelvin temperature of zero degrees Celsius. So the, here you have two different options so that your final answer has, is also coming at one decimal place, pretty much like what was given for the original temperature in degrees Celsius. So you can, if you add only 20, 273, you're gonna get uh, 300.2. But you cannot write, add only 273, you have to add 270.2 for the very least. That's the point. Yes, sir. Sir, if you repeat code, you have to do it. No, I mean, it's I mean, it's a little bit of a problem. 
আমি তোমাদের কথা শুনছি তোমার যতগুলো রেসপন্স করছো আই এম হিয়ারিং অল অফ ইউ ভেরি ক্লিয়ারলি দেন হোয়াই ইজ দিস নেটওয়ার্ক প্রবলেম ইজ ইট ইজ ইট फ्रॉम মাই সাইড আই ডোন্ট থিংক সো ইটস ফর ইন্ডিভিজুয়াল প্রবলেমস জি স্যার কারণ আমি তো আপনার কথা কি আচ্ছা শুনো তোমাদেরকে বলি যারা পিসিস করতেছো but still ne kotha kere jacche there is nothing you can do about this honestly speaking is from the network side or somewhere in the channel that is is about for those who are using a mobile device preferably sit close to your router which actually makes problem far too less <coughs> either bring the router close to you or move your setup and yourself close to the router do either so uh, that that should circumvent the problem and one of the, one other thing that can also happen for both type of users is that if you have uh, not so not not so much high bandwidth connection but uh, as you are doing the classes someone else in your family is using uh, uh, watching 100p youtube videos or any type of other videos or to video channels uh, or daily motion or anything uh, using really good amount of bandwidth you might also have lags that's also another possibility because we all share a bandwidth from the same router i'm not saying it's happening i'm saying it could have it could be happening so check this out Okay, so this is the initial temperature. So you have to do this, and the rise in the temperature can be uh, the rise in the temperature is pretty simple. You can simply separate that values over of these two numbers because uh, uh, the rise in temperature for degrees Celsius scale and, and Kelvin scale is going to be exactly same. So for that thing, you don't have to go for the whole two hundred seventy six point two. You don't have to go for to go that length. All right. Question number eight. B. The car no problem. Sir, C two the problem. Chilo eight er C. हिलियम So you calculate the mole number over here. Then they are asking the mean energy, mean kinetic energy of the atoms. Mean kinetic energy of the atoms is calculated by half m square. And m in this case can be calculated as four u because it is helium four. So four is the number of uh, atomic mass number or relative atomic mass. If you multiply it by the u value, you get the total <coughs> mass of the atom. U is the atomic mass unit. So you know the half m. You need to calculate half m. Half m square. As I am saying, half m square calculate for the power one. Power one to power one. Because that means mass down only. Sorry, C C to down only. My bad. So the mean kinetic energy of energy energy of the atoms. Mean kinetic energy of the energy of the atoms can be calculated very simply. Three by two k. That that will be three by two k t. Yes, three by two k t. K is the Boltzmann constant. Why my trees look like one? That's the expression for for average kinetic energy for one molecule. Bolo. We be given the Boltzmann constant, or do we have to like find it out from R divided by uh, Avogadro's number? Now have a look. प्राइमरिंग <laughs> Quantitative energy available among the particles. The only energy available is in the kinetic energy form. What we did calculate over here is the primarily the individual average kinetic energy of the particles. That's what we calculate over here. And here we calculate the num amount of number of moles that we had available. Being a, we have number of moles available essentially mean we can calculate exactly how many particles are there because one mole contains Avogadro constant equal number of particles. So if we simply calculate out how many total number of molecules are there. And multiply that by the average kinetic energy of those molecules. So each each molecule on average can contain this much kinetic energy. There were this many particles. You multiply them up, you get the total in a kinetic energy for those gas molecules. And since for ideal gas, uh, 
the kinetic energy is basically the total energy. So that's the calculation that have they have gone for. So you don't have to understand the whole, I mean, a whole equation equation for the for the mass scheme. Understand the process that mole number can be converted into number of particles using Gravitas constant, and you have that many atoms available for that scenario, and then multiply that number of atoms with the average kinetic energy of the atom. So you get the total energy contained by those atoms, which is basically your total inter in total yes, internal. Sir, Avogadro constant. Yeah, Avogadro constant is good to have to convert the mole number into number of gas. Sir, I will. Sir, I will. I think so. Do you also have got a constant? Go to the Baba. Asa, I'm sure the Jigish person is a good constant use for the that's that's what I said. That's what I said. That's what I've been saying. Nine nine a acha. They go. Ah, this is a pretty good, good question to work with, uh, which which was a uh, deal with a whole lot of a uh, concept from your all of us. Let's have a look. The resistance of a thermistor at degree Celsius is <coughs> thirty eight four zero ohm. At hundred degree Celsius, the resistance is one hundred ninety ohm. When the thermistor is placed in water at a particular constant temperature, this resistance is two hundred thirty one three hundred ohm. Assuming he assuming that the resistance of the thermistor varies linearly with temperature, calculate the temperature of the water. Okay, uh, this can be calculated pretty simply by using the concept of thermometers we learned in our all of us, which actually is covered in our A2 books. But I didn't go through these topics because <laughs> these were uh, from your all of us part. So I'm gonna essentially show you the mechanism in our uh, in our uh, washing solution class. So it's not gonna be missing and be available to you here. So check this out. What, 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 do, what do I mean? One of the uh, one of the basic ideas for how thermometers work is, <coughs> let's say there is a thing called thermo 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 thermometric property. Thermometric property is the physical measurable property of an object that changes linearly with not. I didn't say directly proportional. I said that changes linearly with the change of temperature. For example, uh, solid objects. Uh, we are gonna have their length increased uh, linearly. Metals more accurately. Metals will expand in length, uh, uh, or the surface areas will expand linearly, or the volume would expand linearly with temperature change. So that's possible. And then you can have uh, the liquid expansion can happen linearly, which we use it for mercury thermometer for for alcohol thermometer. Then we can have the pressure of a fixed amount of gas, or the uh, at, at constant volume, or the <laughs> Volume of a fixed amount of gas maintained at a constant pressure. Either of these variables will change linearly with with temperature. There can be a lot of different lot of different measurable properties of objects which can change linearly with temperature. These properties can be used to make a thermometer, and they are called thermometric properties, which change linearly with temperature. Uh, do you do you guys understand what do I mean by linearly? What is it? Do you guys understand what is the difference between the word linearly and directly proportional? Yes, sir. If any of you have confusion about this, that is in uh, response. I'll explain. Sir, problem. Uh, directly proportional relationship is exclusively passing through the origin. Definitely must be a straight line, but it has to go through the origin. Whereas a linear relationship can go through the origin, might not go through the origin. For example, if you are trying to plot theta versus t, this is the most likely scenario. If you are plotting Kelvin versus t, this might be the most likely scenario. Linear relationship is both. Degree proportional relationship is only this one. That's the difference. Thank you, sir. Sure. One of the mathematical, I mean, not one of the, the core <coughs> mathematical mathematical expression 
that gives us the, uh, yeah, that, that, that works with the whole idea of, uh, of parameter can be written like this. Let's say I'm going to, I'm going to label here the relevant thermometry property that we're going to measure at as X. Now this X might be anything for a, for a resistance thermometer, this X means resistance. For a liquid in glass thermometer, this X can represent length of the liquid column. For a fixed volume of, uh, fixed volume uh, for, a, for a gas amount, which is, has a fixed volume, this can be pressure. So this is the variable that you are going to measure to find out the temperature. So this is a thermometry property. So X is a generic symbol for the thermometry property, which can be L, which can be R, which can be P, which can be V, which can be Habi Jabi, it can be a lot of stuff. And let's say the temperature is measured as theta. So the primary principle by which any thermometer works is this. Change of thermometry property should be directly proportional to change of temperature. This is the working principle for any thermometer whatsoever in the entire damn world. Change of thermometry property should be directly proportional to change of temperature. Now you might wonder, sir, if, uh, you might wonder, I just told you a little bit earlier that we can have the change relationship linear then why does the directly proportional shift showing up? Because here's the deal. A linear graph, if I draw, if I, if, if we have an object that is linear, which is not directly proportional, it's proportional. So in this case, I cannot write that delta theta equals to, I, I cannot write that theta is proportional to T. Can I write this? For this graph, can I write this? Look at it. It's not origin, passing to the origin. Can I write this equation? Theta plus something is proportional to T. And the theta is not proportional to T. Exactly. So I cannot write this. That's my point. Can I write this? No, this is wrong. But this graph has a straight line. This graph is a straight line. So it means it has a fixed gradient, which essentially means the gradient or delta theta by delta t, that has to be a constant. Do you agree? Any really linear relationship, whether directly proportional or non directly proportional, uh, any relationship will always have a constant gradient. So I'm here over here writing the gradient as k, for example. I could have written m, but I'm writing k. Now, now you can see pretty well that this would mean that delta theta goes to a constant multiplied by delta. Uh, why am I doing it in this manner? Sorry, the graph was written wrong. What was I thinking? I wanted to write this x versus theta. I cannot write x proportional to theta. That would be wrong. Temperature time graph bolta 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 khali uti maathe gulta sir. I'm sorry. What I should have written over here is that uh, delta x by delta theta that is equals to k or I can write delta x equals to k into delta theta. So now you can see over here that this is k is a constant and if I take out the constant out of the equation I can convert this into a proportional So that's basically the whole idea of a thermometric property. So if whenever these two properties are be working linearly, not, doesn't necessarily have to be a particular proportional, we can always come to this relationship because the graph is supposed to be a straight line. For any straight line, change of change of thermal property should be always directly proportional to the temperature. So a formula, a, a expression term, I validity, validity, everyone. I mean, did you understand? I don't understand. Which part of the question Specific color? I'm not getting your question. I'm sorry. You can take it from there. I'll move forward with the proceedings. I'll allow time for Shubhu to type his question. So we're going to use this relationship over here to make the math work. So I've written over here delta is power to delta theta. Now here you have to understand that the x in this case would represent resistances. I cannot use this equation directly for my purpose, but I can essentially write, convert this into an into a uh, pro, uh, equation. So one of the easier way to uh, convert any proportional into an equation look like this. You can write delta x1, you have a delta x2 should be equals to delta theta1, you have a delta theta2. 
Now, from this point onwards, you can work your math out in many different versions. So I'm going to show you one version of this of this equation over here, and have a look. I'm going to use the same value of temperature or x proportionately. So I'm going to write this equation over here. Let's say delta a, delta R one divided by delta R two. Do you guys understand why why the x is becoming R over here? Hold on. Thermometric property. Sir, thermometric property. Sir. So over here to calculate the delta R, I can use different versions. But what is really important that I'm going to have to keep similarity on both sides. So I'm going to write two division lines over here. And add up those values as I go ahead. For example, let's say uh, at zero Celsius, the temperature uh, the thermistor had a temperature of 3840. So if I write 3840 over here, this temperature was supposed to be zero. At 100 degrees, the resistance was 190. So if I write 190 over here, this is supposed to be 100. If you want to answer to Lajbana, answer to Lajbana. You will see the magic in a while. Then it says when the temperature submission was placed in water at a particular constant temperature, the resistance was 2300 degrees or 2300 ohm. Now, if you want to do a calculation for 2300 ohm, there are two different things you can do. You can, I mean, actually there are a lot of different things you can do. You can do 3840 minus 2300. You can do 200 to 2300 minus, minus 3840. Or you can do 2300 uh, minus uh, 190. Or you can do 190 minus 2300. You can do either of these things. So let's say I'm going to go for the easier version, which makes good sense to me. Let's say 3840. So since I've written 840 over here, which is one of the known values, I have to write uh, zero over here. And then I'm going to write the relevant resistance for the unknown temperature, that's 2300. So I'm going to write the theta over here. That's basically one way to go ahead for the equation. That's it. So now you calculate this up and you should get a number for this. Someone give me a, give me a, give me a value for this, for this, for this answer, for this answer. 42.2 degrees Celsius. This exact equation, not, I mean, I, I'm not asking for the other version because I'm going to show you the validity of this proportionality for using other, other expressions over here as well. Give me the, give me an exact value using this exclusive equation. Did you get 42.2? 42. 42. 42 point? Sir, 42.2 give me a couple of more days because i want to do a comparison okay sir amar last step 100 minus 57.8 as chilo so that gave me 42.2 actually it's fine let's say we are going to keep it 42.2 but we can essentially work with more decent as well i mean there's a reason i may i'm writing this number the point that I'm trying to validate is that it, this, it's not important that you have to remember which one comes where. You have to just remember this relationship, which basically uh, uh, comes from this relationship. So uh, if I go ahead and write some other format of this calculation, it's going to to work out. Wait, let me finish and then I'll take questions. So what I mean is this. Let's say if I start from 2300, which is 42.1917. 1. Nine. One nine one seven eight. Seven eight. Okay. Yes, sir. So let's say if I want to do the ex uh, whole experiment with a different set of equation, let's say if I want to go by 2300 first, which you can do as well. Let's say 2300 minus 190. So if I write the 2300 over here, this is my unknown. So I'm going to write the unknown temperature theta over here. And my th and 190 was relevant for 100 degrees, so I'm going to minus 100 over here. I'm going to use any of the two information over here. So, for example, I can also write 384 minus 2300 as well. So, what is going to happen? I mean, the reason this pro this problem is going to be a bit difficult for us because we're going to have theta on both sides. Sorry, we'll see. 340 temperature to zero, and I can have minus theta. So, since we have gone, we have over here this calculation is going to be a bit lengthy but do this calculation everyone please and give me an answer for theta for a couple of decimal places 42.1918 same thing yes sir exactly same thing 
<coughs> everyone check this out Sumaya, what you wrote is absolutely correct. Uh, we do not use the word linearly proportional. That's not a phrase that actually uh, in use. We use they are they are re related linearly, or which essentially means that if you plot the uh, graph of those two variables, you are gonna definitely end up with a straight line, which might or might not go through origin. Sir, so, uh, what will say? Okay, so that's the point I was trying to make. So you don't essentially have to remember the sequence, but what you have to always make sure that you place all the relevant thermometry property with relevant places for the equation. So this thing has to be maintained properly, and you will always end up with the exact same number. Is it clear, sir? So far? Yes, sir. Mamun. 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 So, never mind, he is not here. Asha, Asadul Butsita. Asha, Butsha, she is fine. You gave her a song. Anything else from this question? Question number nine. Any part? Any other Sir, part? Sir, nine, eighty-two. Eighty-two. Yes. Nine, eighty-two. Yes, sir. I mean, we take to expand. Correct. Hello, hello. Asha, the temperature of the water, as measured on, uh, on the thermometer scale of temperature, is two hundred eighty-six Kelvin. By reference to what is meant. By the thermal scale temperature, comment your answer in one. Okay. So, this is a three mark question, question, which makes it quite uh, important that we understand what the question is about. By reference to what is meant by the thermal scale of temperature, comment your answer in one. Now, comment is a vague term. Uh, it is, I mean, you do not know, are they ask, are they, they, uh, what, what, you cannot very well specify what they are asking. I mean, if it's, it's not a uh, steadiness or suggestion explaining kind of question, which is a bit specific, or describe question where you essentially go for the happening, not essentially for the reason of the happening, uh, comment could actually be a lot of things. So you have to know specifically uh, what the examiners are going, going after for this temperature. So other than beating around the, beating around the bush, I'm gonna look at the Mars scheme and try to explain this Mars scheme to you. So what we have in the Mars scheme in front of question number nine, it says that either 286 Kelvin is equivalent to 13 degrees Celsius or 42 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 315 Kelvin. And it says for the thermodynamic scale does not depend on the property of a substance. So changing resistance with temperature is nonlinear. This is an important bit of information. Oh, yeah, what they are trying to show you is that they have quote one set of value that 286 Kelvin is equivalent to 13 degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 315 Kelvin. So they converted the two different range that we had available over here. What, what? This is not the question, is it? This is the question, 286 Kelvin. What is 42 degrees Celsius? Oh, so 42 degrees Celsius was your answer, my bad. Yeah, uh, yeah. you have to show that any of this, uh, you first have to show the conversion of any of this to any of this to value. So you can go either way from Kelvin to 13 or 13 to Kelvin or uh, other way. So there should be a mention of the temperature conversion. And then they were just saying that thermodynamic scale does not depend on the property of a substance. So that's one of the key proper, key behavior. That's one of the key aspect of thermodynamic scale that Thermodynamic scale was is actually it was developed easy by observing the behavior of gas volume as temperature was changing. So when Sandis Charles was doing his experiment, he actually found out that whenever he plotted the volume versus time graph for multiple different gases or for one single gas for multiple uh, different amount of mole number, he found out that they all produce a very very beautiful straight line. But whenever we uh, bring about this straight line. Uh, Bring about this straight line. Uh, 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 extend this distance on the left side. They all cut the axis at the at a certain certain point. 
so that was the basic location or basic have incident from which we came to understand came to first know about the existence of the thermodynamic temperature but what this what this what this statement mean the thermodynamic scale does not <laughs> depend on the property of substance so it was defined ultimately as an universal temperature where the kinetic energy of all the molecules is zero or the particles object do not have any more internal ex extractable internal energy left i'm using the word extractable because the absolute zero temperature means where the particles stop vibration stopping vibration would means that there be no kinetic energy left but there might still be potential energy left because a lump of objects might have significant amount of, of attraction between them because of their uh, intermolecular forces. So when you have, if you can somehow extract out all the possible energy out of an object, the final temperature of that object is supposed to be zero Kelvin. That's how we have defined thermodynamic temperature scale, which is not dependent on any specific physical property. For as, I mean, we, one of the ways to make sense of this thing is that uh, the degree Celsius scale is defined <coughs> as using a substance that's called pure water. Whereas thermodynamic scale is not exclusive for the, any specific substance or any other specific property. So that's the information that you have to provide. And finally, what they're saying, so changing the resistance of thermometer with temperature is non-linear. So if you want to plot the K, uh, so if you want to plot the resistance versus thermodynamic temperature, you are gonna end up with a non-linear graph. So your del K might be proportional to del theta. Yes, but your hold up, genuine resistance. Hold on, sorry, too much. What? Wait. <coughs> the majority of the candidates failed to give a suitable description of the thermodynamic scale of temperature. There were some elements on the relationship between the Kelvin and system. And some went on to give the actual values determining this for this question. <laughs> in the variable end is we mentioned that the non range of the resistance change. Acha, Bucci. What they are trying to mean is that if you actually plot resistance versus theta, you're not going to get a straight line graph like this. In fact, this is not going to happen. This is what we're assuming for our maths to work out. But they are saying that if you, if you actually plot R versus theta, you should get a graph like this. Basically, this is how the resistor for the thermometer, this is how the thermistor graph actually looks like. So this equation was based upon the idea that this is supposed to be a state line, <coughs> which we have used for the calculation. But in practical cases, this behavior change is non-linear. That's you have to mention over here. Now, if you wonder, are we supposed to know this? The answer is a yes, because, because of one thing, uh, you will eventually come across the deviations in chapter uh, of your syllabus, which will bring you to the idea of the syllabus. syllabus behavior. <clears throat> this application booklet, which you're going to cover. So, so this is the graph that you're going to essentially learn about. If you have a, uh, this is one of the examples for a certain thermistor. So this is an example graph, which may, this is showing, this is showing us that if you increase the temperature value of a thermistor from a certain temperature value, which in this case was zero, the temperature, the resistance of the thermistor is gonna decrease. And it's gonna, it's decreasing through a decreasing pattern. You can see that as you slowly increase the temperature, the graph is never actually becoming zero. And this is also very true for any thermistor, I shouldn't say for any thermistor, for a typical thermistor, as you keep increasing the temperature, your resistance is gonna become less and less and further less, but it's usually never gonna become absolutely zero. I'm using the word usually because superconductivity is actually a thing. And by using a very specific composition of materials at a very specific uh, proportion and operating them at a very specific temperature, you can actually achieve superconductivity. Superconductivity means that there can be a certain scenario for a mixture of objects with appropriate proportion and everything, we can have that object to have zero resistance. So it's pretty difficult to achieve, but it's, uh, it's possible. It's possible. The reason superconductivity is very important for us, I mean, this, this, this thing, I mean, superconductivity is extremely important for us for cases or scientific, scientific experiments where you have to maintain a very high amount of current over a coil. Uh, to be more exact, if you are trying to produce an extremely strong magnetic field. 
if you want to produce an extremely strong magnetic field you would require a very large coil which operates with a very high current now if you even have a slightest amount of resistance for a very high current p equals to i square r comes into effect and your coil is going to become heated up really, really 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 hot so if you still want to maintain a very high magnetic field the only logical way that you could possibly achieve to have a very high current without having to deal with the temperature uh, temperature generated in the wire is if you can somehow make the resistance factor gone zero so that's called superconductivity which is not covered in your syllabus but i wanted you to know this thing that's why i use the term usually but yeah so what that the third information that that the examiners are looking for is that although we have used the idea of linearity for our equation but in practical cases this is versus temperature is not a linear graph so you have to know the truth behind it questions mukto <laughs> So, sir, we need to calibrate the resistance thermometer for accurate measurement. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> and in 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 true case, what what we, I mean I mean uh, in true case means that one of the ways that we can always use nonlinear behavior, nonlinear properties uh, to work for a good thermometer property is that let's say a certain thermometer that you have bought, which was designed to work with the resistance of the thermistor. These thermometers should be should come along with a graph, with a large graph of its temperature versus te resistance temperature variation, from which graph you should be able to plot out the possible temperature, or there should be a large uh, table with very small gap intervals so that you can extrapolate the you know, relationship between them by some mathematical question. So large table means let's say uh, the resistance individual resistance values for those temperature for for different temperature might be given at. Let's say two or three degrees Celsius or two or four degrees Celsius interval. So in in that case, we can assume that uh, if we know that temperature resistance well for very small intervals, we can mathematically extrapolate out or oh, sorry interpolate out the value in between. That's possible to achieve. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sure. So there was another person who raised their hand who dropped their hand. I believe they got the answer question answered. Okay. Anupsha gave, gave us a question in the in the chat window. Let's have a look at that. Uh, theta equals to r theta minus r zero. Do you have a r hundred minus r zero or theta equals to r theta minus r zero? So r r has been answered. Sorry. Ita have been like formulas koto like apna method is koto. Well, to be honest, this format is the same format as mine. Uh, the b the b b benefit that you have over here is that this theta that you have written on the left side, uh, which we have learned in our all of us as the primary equation, basically means this. Theta minus zero. Do you have a hundred minus zero? This is the basic expression for this theta on the left side, which ultimately, if you keep the subject the theta, this hundred gets multiplied on the other side. So, if this temperature, if these two temperatures are not hundred, or if this, if, if one of the temperature is not zero, then you cannot use this expression. So, this, this, this expression that we have learned in all of us uh, is not essentially universal for all the temperature scales. On a butcher, you will say. Uh, theta minus lowest divided by theta highest minus theta lowest order. Yeah, exactly. That that always works. So we are here. Uh, question number ten. Anyone? Eleven. Sir, 11B the ekta question chilo je ora okhane ekta equal pressure ki bhabe manage koreche dui ta mane container er moddhe mane match ta perechi kintu question chilo ar ki je pressure ta keno same thakche because they can't do with can't do with the tube over here when they can't do with the tube which means gas molecules can uh, unobstructedly flow across the tube so that the pressure constant everywhere so if you have the gas that can flow around or across you are always going to have gas flow happening from the high pressure region to the cold uh, low pressure region if there is a pressure difference which will ultimately bring the pressure of the two containers exactly same and that's when the pressure level, uh, flow of the gas will practically stop okay sir sure <clears throat> 12 
chapter 12 b2 12 b2 Martin Lexo Yes sir okay. The first law of may be expressed in the form of daily equals to Q plus W is from the symbol in the system. Daily is the increase in temperature internal energy. Q is the heat supplied to the system. W is work done on the system. Prepositions are very important. Set was more specific latent heat. That's a definition. Use the have a look. Def, specific latent heat definition is three marks. Dawas. So watch out for the equation if you don't understand what these three marks are for. So look at the mark scheme on your own and try to figure this out. If you have questions, ask me. <laughs> B2 they will say. Use the first of thermodynamics to explain why the specific latent heat of vaporization is greater than the specific latent heat of fusion for a, part, for a particular substance. So here we have to consider two different aspects. First of all, <coughs> whenever we convert, uh, whenever I mean, let me explain the whole thing, and then I can uh, we can look at the Marcion to get the exact words that were supposed to write. Latent heat of fusion means we are melting an object, so we are essentially Converting the strong intermolecular forces that exist between solid particles to weaken to such an extent so that they would become free from the lattice structure or three dimensional structure uh, and they will be able to move around each other. But they are still gonna be have a significant amount of intermolecular force remaining between them, among them. As a result, they will be moving around in clusters. So that's the liquid stage. So they are not fixed in position, but they are pretty much clumped together. They can move around, but they are not essentially absolutely free of, free of each other. So the intermolecular force will already reduce, but it did not drop to zero. That's the first information. So if you think for in terms, in terms of separation, I'll give you the floor. If you consider in terms of separation, intermolecular separation, I mean, for a gaseous substance and for a liquid substance, the intermolecular separations are pretty much the same. I'm using the word pretty much because for the gaseous state in the in the uh, sorry, in the gaseous state, uh, for in the, sorry, in the, 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 the in the solid state, the in the solid state the particles are stuck and they are touching each other. In the liquid state they are not stuck but they're still touching each other. So the intermolecular spacing are quite similar. I'm using the word quite similar because the other variation that we can have for the uh, state change is that we can have liquid converts into gas. When the liquid converts into gas, the particles completely have to overcome the intermolecular attraction force. So there's a big difference. When the particles, when the object was melted, we have to weaken the intermolecular force by a certain value. But whenever you are trying to melt, when, when you're trying to boil the liquid, you have to entirely overcome the intermolecular forces so the particles will be particles will be completely stripped off from each other's attraction force and they will become free of each other altogether. That's observation, that's point number one. So you're gonna require you are supposed to require a significantly larger amount of energy because you are making the intermolecular separation largely bigger. That's up point one. The second point is that whenever you will convert a certain liquid into gas, those gas molecules have to undergo some significant volume expansion. To accommodate for this volume expansion, they have to push out the atmosphere and occupy their own space. Which means to make it happen that we will achieve this behavior, the in the process of boiling, the liquid molecules would have to convert into gas, and at the same time, they have to claim volume for their own existence. So they have to push out the atmospheric molecules outwards to occupy their own volume, which means they're gonna do significant amount of work on the atmospheric, atmospheric molecules as those molecules are gonna be pushed out. So they will be doing work on the, on the atmosphere. So work is gonna get out. So if you look at this equation, this W will be negative, significantly large amount of negative value of W should be there. Because in this case, the W was meant as work done on the system, but for the case of liquid to gas conversion, boiling, uh, work is done by the system on the environment. And here, the delta W would also be bigger because delta W would be coming from the uh, idea because we are working with uh, uh, state change. So the kinetic energy of the particles would not be different for the two states because uh, uh, I told you that kinetic energy of the particles are exclusively dependent on the temperature and potential energy of the particles are dependent on the intermolecular spacing. So, Kinetic energy of the particles are going to be pretty much same. So 
whenever we whenever the particles are going to be separated more further apart we have to have the particles are going to have bigger amount of internal energy so this delta u would be larger for boiling process because the particles will be separated more this w would also be negative because work will be done on the system so to compensate both of these factors q has to be extremely large so that this equation is satisfied sir yes kinetic energy same ki karone thake je gas ta oi mane atmosphere ke push out korar jonno je work done ta kore shei work done ta te ki kinetic energy energy ta loss hoye jay e karone ki same thakche by any chance no <clears throat> no that's not the explanation temperature er bapare temperature equivalence yes sir kinetic energy of objects are defined exclusively on the temperature factor think about it uh, for ideal gas what did you get uh, half mc square equals to 3 by 2 kt so kinetic energy of a certain gas molecule was exclusively dependent on the temperature we can apply this logic for most other objects as well so whenever we do melting the temperature of the solid state and temperature of the liquid state are same as long as all the melting is not done so for the entire process of melting process for the entire duration of melting process both the solid particles and the liquid particles have the same temperature they only have two different states so in the melting process we say that the kinetic energy of the of the of the solid particles and the kinetic energy of the liquid particles would be same but the liquid particles will have more p compared to the solid particles and equally applicable for liquid to gas conversion as well so basically the heat is used to break the bonds so e karone kinetic energy kono change hocche na uh i wouldn't say it this way uh, you said one reason and you mentioned the other happening but i would say that because the temperature of the liquid and the gas molecules are same that's why there is no difference in kinetic energy but if you want to use that because we are breaking the bonds that's why there is an increase in potential energy so reason and effect should be uh, proper what you said both of them are correct but they are not placed properly the way we define the non change of temperature non change of kinetic energy is relevant to temperature not being changed, not being different Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Charles. <coughs> sir. Have a look at the. Let's have a look at the Mars game. Uh, just a second. Uh, let's have a look at the Mars game, and then I'll take questions. For uh, five, uh, I'll be as one to show them. Okay. Uh, it is the other number. This is twelve. When when you are putting greater change of separation of molecules so, and greater change in volume, so identify each pair correctly with delta U and W. Very cool. So delta U would become larger, delta and W would be negative. So Q has to be bigger. Okay. Most answers were given little credit because the question had not been read carefully. Wow. Tell me about it. And <coughs> consequently, a comparison was not made between the two changes of state. For example, many candidates stated that the volume change on evaporation is very large, but then did not mention the volume change on melting. Likewise, the differences between the changes in the separation of the molecules, so the difference between the nature of the bonds, was not discussed. Rather, a statement was made regarding one change of state. Okay, I get it. The question was asking us exclusively that why the specific identity of vaporization is greater than the specific identity of fusion for a particular substance. So we have to compare both of these things. So the way how would I write this answer if I have, since I've gone through the mask and the examination about both. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, but I don't want to take discussion about it. So try to understand what I'm saying. I'd write like this in the melting process the intermolecular force is weakened comma volume change is negligible full stop in the boiling process intermolecular force is overcome completely and volume of the particles volume occupied by the particles increases significantly two sentences next i'm going to write so in the boiling process del u is bigger than melting and also W is negative. 
<coughs> so q has to be bigger significantly bigger for the latent heat of vaporization compared to latent heat of fusion yep bujhe gaye ki yes sir everyone else ji ji sir there 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 is a method to there should always be a method to your madness madness is not the word here there is a there is always to be a method to your answer i mean you need to know exactly what you are trying to write <clears throat> i mean one of the most difficult things that kids come across whenever they are writing basic question is that the answer comes is in your stomach you know for a fact it's in your brain as well but you cannot make it express out of your pen that is a common difficulty you have to understand that difference and eventually make it happen i mean something like the yeah you know right so 13 13 14 so i had a question acha yeah i saw it yes yes go ahead i forgot At the last uh, line of the uh, mark scheme of, uh, uh, for 12 like i didn't get the, the last line i didn't five identifies each uh, different <laughs> directly with delta u and w identifies each difference would mean that what is the value what is the difference of del u amount that is relevant for fusion and also for boiling so the way i go when it is that in the melting process the intermolecular forces weakened when in the boiling process intermolecular forces completely overcome so gaining internal energy compared to these two steps for the same amount of mass the delta u must be bigger for boiling because you are entirely obliterating the intermolecular force among the particles they are being separated out so at so high distances from each other that they would acknowledge no intermolecular force among them whatsoever so del u would be significantly larger for the case of boiling compared to for the case of melting okay that's point one <laughs> and the other thing is that w which is the work done on the on uh, work done on the substance uh w would be approximately zero for the melting process because the intermolecular separation pretty much remains the same for for a solid state to end into a liquid state because the particles still touch each other that they just not stuck for the liquid state or in the solid but in the solid state they are stuck but the particles are still very much in contact with each with, with each other you can try think about some marbles <laughs> which you might make a pretty good example uh in a beaker so that's for the so for boiling for the melting process the w is practically zero but for the boiling process w is largely negative because the objects have to convert themselves into gas and have to claim their volume in the atmosphere as well so work has to be done by the by the liquid in, liquid liquid converted into gas particles as they push out the atmosphere out so work in this case will not be getting into the system work has to be done by the system to make the process happen possible so the logic is that if you compare between the two process del u is bigger compared to boiling a uh, compared to melting del u is bigger in boiling and also if you consider the j value for w for the melting process w is almost zero whereas for the boiling process w is highly negative both of these factors will attribute towards a very large increase of q for the boiling process compared to melting process also sir due to the vo volume increase there is a large increase of potential energy yes definitely okay okay it makes sense now sir thank you no problem okay we have a question from third in b can you see it a catalyst related as uh, as 2.3 kilowatt a mass of 750 g of water at 20 degrees celsius is poured into the kettle when the kettle is switched on it takes 20 minutes to bring uh, for the water to start boiling <sighs> sorry in a further 7.0 minutes one half of the mass of the water is boiled away estimate for this water the switch heat capacity okay sir ekhane to q equals to mc delta theta use korlei hobe right ha for the first part q equals to mc delta theta use korlei hobe मैं 
or 80 <coughs> Kelvin or degrees Celsius, it doesn't matter. And number two, it says the specific line heat of vaporization. Have have a look. The question says that in a further seven minutes, one half of the mass of the water is boiled away. How much water did boil away then? What is the mass of the water that is boiled away? Half of the mass of the available in the beginning with. So you started the uh, the the heating process with 750 gram of water. If half of the water is boiled away, then how much water has boiled away? Half of 750 gram, which is 0 0.375. So this question. So let me just take this take, take this one out, so, so that I can use these numbers. So I'm um, if I if I'm trying to calculate the uh, latent heat, so forget about this question. So my equation for the latent heat calculation is Q equals to m into L V. Now in this case, Q is gonna be power into seven minute minute. M would be zero point seven five zero divided by two, this many kgs, and LV is your unknown. So you place all the values over here, power to the asset one two kilowatt. You place everything and you get the answer. One of the mistakes that you might have come across is either uh, choosing the time amount different or maybe not dividing this by two. These are two possible sources of error you might have had. What did I say? Seven I wrote seven minutes because I didn't want to do the conversion. I wanted to use your brain to do the conversion. But yes, definitely. If you want to get the answer in joule for the heat amount, you have to convert the minute into second, obviously. Yes. The answer to your question is yes. Asadul, <coughs> Yes, yes. Uh, all right. Uh, thirteen beta mother question. Oh, sorry, you didn't ask me this one. You asked me for B. My bad. Sorry. Thirteen beta question. My bad. Chair one assumption made in a calculation is whether this will lead to an overestimation and underestimation for the velocity line hit. I've been I have explained the idea of overestimation and underestimation with enough effort to all of you so that you do not get stuck into these questions. So bottom line, I'll use the shortcut that I told you. I'm not gonna get into the large description. If you have come through the large description, please look out for the earlier videos. So a short explanation was that this scenario that we are doing, our apparatus setup has a higher temperature than the atmosphere. So heat will be going out from our scenario. So since heat is going out, so this is a visualization of water spilling out of our bucket because you cannot accommodate all the water in your bucket. So that's a uh, short thing. So if water is falling out, then your measurement would be overestimation. So there's a shortcut. For the long explanation, look up the other videos. Why it has to be long, uh, overestimation. You look at the earlier videos, you still have questions which still doesn't make sense. Respond to me uh, uh, personally in the messenger, messenger chat. I'll, I'll help you understand. Don't worry. 14. Sir, 14AB. Uh, okay, let's have a look. 14. The image generator in, in the thermometer may be used for the measurement of temperature in Fear 71. Fear 71 shows the variation of temperature T of the EM. So we have an EM versus temperature graph. We have a curve, beautiful. By reference to Fear 71, <laughs> State two disadvantage of using the thermocouple when the image is about 1.0 millivolts. Acha, yeah, this is very simple. If you have 1.0 millivolt in your uh, uh, voltage rig, uh, red in your uh, thermocouple thermometer, it can give us two different values of temperature from the graph because the graph actually it rises up to a maximum value and then it falls down. For one one millivolt value, you might as well get somewhere around uh, less than 400. This might be how much? 200, 250. 75, 380-ish sort of a temperature. So it's possible for us to have one temperature over here and the graph can also equivocally uh, represent the temperature which is over here, which might be somewhere around 700-ish. So the, we do not have a specific fixed value of temperature only by observing at the graph. Now to decide 
how could we possibly get that value? We have to uh, have other precursor that which temperature that we are going for. Uh, two disadvantages. So that's one disadvantage. What is the other disadvantage? Sir. Yes. Sir, thermocouple je change hoy, sheta to linearly change hoy. Shekhetre erokom ekta graph ashlo ki bhabe, ar duita temperature iba kano dekhatche. Oi jinista puste barchi na. Thermocouple at EMF linearly change hoy, sheta dhoroni ama maths gula kori. But practically thermocouple thermocouple thermometer EMF actually linearly change hoy na. That's. Achha sir. Bucho. Sir, term number ideal case, right? Uh, we are we are assuming the ratio should be linear, but it doesn't have to be an ideal gas. I mean, for physical objects like liquid in mar mercury volume or alcohol volume, their volume expansions are quite linear. Quite linear, their volumes are linear. So it doesn't have to be considered as an ideal gas. We are assuming these lines to be straight, or in other words, we can say that we are gonna compare we're gonna consider the variation of temperature for those thermocouples to for such a small re region that that part of the curve can be practically considered to be a line, straight line. So these are there are two different ways to uh, go ahead, go around this error. Sir, but it a quadratic holo cano. Mane arono type of to hote parto. What number chill generator? 14. Variation is nonlinear to possible temperature. Oh, works. This figure was not done by doing some mathematical manipulation. This type of figures that usually come across with two different variables, they are experiment obtained values. Why does a physical object gives this kind of this kind of a graph is to be experimented upon and analyzed. That why part is basically the question of doing all these kind of experiments, which I do not know an answer for. We need to do mathematical scientific experiment on substances to get those answers. Achha, sir, Bucci. Bucci. Achha. <laughs> B number. An alternative to a thermocol thermometer is the resistance thermometer. Step two advantages that a thermocol thermometer has over a resistance thermometer. Step two advantages that a thermocol thermometer has over a resistance thermometer. Uh, I don't know, I forgot this class. I'll have a look at the mask. Resistance thermometer key voltage you have some process. So thermocouple is uh, highly sensitive and it can be used to measure very specific cases. So highly sensitive into a use for an mask. You please have a look at the mask scheme so to make sense of the mask. If you don't, then sir, I will go ahead. Yeah, Sir, resistance. I, I, heard, I heard your question. I heard your question. Oh, what's a probological level? <laughs> yes, digital, digital. Level. Yep. So, you insert this into an object. So, inside this cover, we have something, some specific material which has a wire. So, yeah, this is the inside view. So, the resistance is measured within this device, and that eventually, as inside, it gives you the output directly out of here. Yeah. Makes sense. Why not? Sir, do we use a metal like a thermistor more than semiconductors use for even more? I think that depends upon the choice of your temperature variation range that you're gonna work upon. But I, 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 what I believe that we should be able to use both of them. Exactly, a mark scheme like a chill like thermistor as sorry thermocouple as well as resistance thermometer. These are non-linear three type. Hmm. So that means that metal use for the non-linear thing, then that means that most cases I'm a Thermistor use code they can non linear voltage. Okay, guys, I didn't want to tell you this, but since you guys I brought this up every once in a while, let me tell you this. The way you are taught to do the temperature calculation is like this. Okay, guys, 
that's how you are taught to do the calculation to be honest whenever whenever any of these uh, thermocouple or nonlinear uh, thermometry properties are used usually the digital software or digital part which gives you a reading output they are trained or designed on an algorithm that has a mathematical expression that recuperates with the variation for example this would give us a linear equation anyway y equals to mx plus c but let's say for a race parameter we might as well teach the the digital circuitry that you are going to work on this graph like this r equals to r naught a to the power minus x theta this will give you a perfect behavior for an area exponential graph for the for the emf we might as well teach the thermometer let's say emf is gonna be uh what a plus b into theta to the power so theta to na delta theta to the power n so you might as well have this kind of an equation do i make sense yes sir we actually operate significant number of experiments to find out the exact equation that will define that material situation behavior or that specific thermocouple's emf behavior and we'll teach the digital software which will convert that those values into uh, ultimate temperature output by this equation so it will be able to do its own calculation and show you the temperature reading directly so this will be embedded within its own coding but for your level you are not supposed to bother about these things for your syllabus this is good enough sir 39 abar erokom ekta question jigesh korechilo jan erokom ekta point chilo marks ki sir ekta dekhben kala koto number question 39a আচ্ছা দেখব একটু দাঁড়াও বলবান এই যে শুনে বুঝে গেছে মানে ডু হ্যাভ এনি কোশ্চেন अबाउट দিস পার্ট স্যার দে হ্যাভ গিভেন এন एग्जांपल টাইপ অফ आंसर व्हिच मींस ইউ ক্যান রাইট এনি ফোর অফ দোজ অর লজিক্যালি ইফ ইউ রাইট এনিথিং এলস আদার দ্যান দিস ফোর পয়েন্টস व्हिच एक्चुअली আর রিলেভেন্ট আই ইউ ক্যান অলসো গেট দা মার্ক एग्जांपल क्वेश्चंस हैव अ লার্জ লার্জ অ্যাকসেপ্টেবিলিটি বাট আর ইউ আর ইউ ওকে উইথ দিস आंसर চয়েসেস ডু ইউ আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড অল অফ দিস স্যার 1 এন্ড 2 টা বুঝি নাই thermal thermometers have a small thermal capacity or measures the delta for small objects or short response time this means that the way thermal thermometers work is that we have to have a hot junction and we have to have a cold junction the cold junction is always the user end and the hot junction is a very small piece of metallic part which has to be in contact with the hot object now because the hot junction can be designed to be extremely small where the two wires two different metal wires will essentially pinch into together join into two, together that's the hot junction so you can essentially contact make a contact of this hot junction point to a very small area of the hot object that you want to measure the temperature for because the mass of the object which has to be in, which has to experience that temperature increase is extremely small can be designed to be extremely small the amount of heat that it will take from the hot object is going to be pretty small as well so since a small mass so small thermal capacity so the temperature rise would happen really fast so that would essentially result in a much short response time which means it's going to have a higher responsiveness because it's going to take less it requires less heat to show that uh, temperature increase so it's going to take less time to achieve that temperature increase compared to resistance thermometer if you have uh, so for resistance thermometer you have to insert the whole shaft into the hot object and you have to wait for the heat to be absorbed through the metal sheet into the resistance material and everything has to reach the same temperature as the hot object only then can you get the temperature reading out of it so it's going to be uh, quite some time so small thermal capacity means basically resistance to come isn't it material resistivity to come no? thermal capacity is not relevant material to resistivity. thermal capacity is relevant to how much heat do you require for its temperature to be increased by a certain value small thermal yes, capacity sir. it requires thermal resistivity jodi sir beshi hoy tahole to ora nite parbe na temperature barate parbe na taratari what do you mean by thermal resistivity like sir ekta material er resistivity thake na seta jodi resistivity kom hoy tahole to electric resistivity there is no quantity that is defined as thermal resistivity but let me but elaborate to me what do you mean by it like sir 
মানে থার্মাল ক্যাপাসিটি স্যার মানে একটা সার্টেন মানে অ্যামাউন্ট অফ এনার্জি তো দাও লাগে টু ইনক্রিজ দ্য টেম্পারেচার অফ এন অবজেক্ট ইয়েস তাহলে মানে ওর এই পার্টিকুলার টেম্পারেচারটা বাড়াইতে তো কম লাগছে এনার্জি এক্স্যাক্টলি সো দ্য টার্ম ইজ থার্মাল ক্যাপাসিটি নট থার্মাল রিসিভিটি সো ডোন্ট ইউজ डिफरेंट টার্মিনোলজি সো দ্যাট উইল লুজ মার্ক you might have the concept wrong but using different terminology will cause it to lose the mark so be careful about that i totally understood what you said in the first place but i wanted you to be cautious not to use those terminologies because we cannot use made up terms in physics not allowed rafi koto number question e bolchila jeno sir 39 Sir, there was another doubt with the thing about the thermal content. Thirty-nine. Oh, correct, Shilona sir. Hey, Jee, can I? A resistance thermometer and thermal thermometer are both used at the same time to measure the temperature of water by this reason. Why, although both temperature thermometers have been calibrated correctly and are at equilibrium, they may record different temperatures. Ah, uh, because they will use different graph or different equation because their graphs are non-linear. So you will not, you might not get the exact same temperature for both of them. Yeah, this question is a treat. So we just need to say, I'm not linear at all, but actually experimentally, at the equation, or more the, the the I'm not thermometer case. So that's why it's gonna be different. Yes, that's basically it. Sir, that whole expansion of the actual non-linearly how? Liquid expansion. I mean, here is a here is a bottom line for this question. So, which is different objects can work uh, differently for even for the minute amount of temperature variation. Now, what what material should you choose? what material should you choose what oh okay so what material should you choose for the what material should you choose for the choice of your thermometric property is not essentially dependent on whether it's it's behaves linearly or not that depends on a lot of aspect more commonly what it works with is that how much should be the size of a thermometer that is a very important factor and also exactly at what temperature range should you use a thermometer at for example you cannot use liquid and glass thermometers for a nuclear reactor not going to work you cannot use uh you cannot use thermocol thermometer to measure the temperature of sun because you cannot place the thermocol thermometer's hot probe into the sun so it uses a different property so depending on how where for which purpose you're going to use the thermometer you have to choose your mechanism and also your choice of material and then we circumvent the issues of the property not being linear by rigorous experimenting and bring about those values of those equation variables that i just showed you into the algorithm so that we can calculate the thermal temperature as close as possible what we want but in many cases they might not give the exact same answer because those variables they are calculated they are definitely going to be rounded up you cannot feed an infinitely long number into your algorithm let's say your experiment detail experiment i mean every experiment has a range of acceptability that's what the answer to the term comes about you have learned about this in your as level so you cannot teach your algorithm with infinitely long number of decimal of a decimal number you have to round up your number to accommodate for it to work around so that's why temperatures can be somewhat different so the question that you just asked me that is the expansion of liquid or expansion of solid that is also somewhat long non linear in my opinion it can be but can we make our way around that the answer is yes okay sir you yes, say Yes. Beautiful. Yes, Ashpi, I have a question. 
turn 39a they said that even though both uh, the they were in equilibrium but why still the temperature changed so why aren't they in thermal equilibrium i mean in this case are those two objects at thermal equilibrium uh, it means that we have inserted both of the temp both of the thermometers into the same hot object so they are exact temperature when the temperature they, both of the individual exact temperature is the same as the temperature of the hot object which means the hot object and both the thermometers they are maintained at the same temperature which means thermal equilibrium okay sir thank you sure so yeah these were pretty unique questions that we have discussed in today's class. It was pretty good, 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 good class. I, I feel good about this, although we didn't proceed any, 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 any further. But I think the discussion was substantial. I believe so. I feel so. Sir, and that uh, thing about the thermocouple, it mentioned one of the advantages was a power supply not required. Oh yeah, yeah. For the resistance thermometer to work, you have to have an external circuit that should be what that should give you a power supply. So you have to apply voltage. Which is produce a current, and by using the ratio of voltage versus current, you have to calculate the resistance, and then only can you work with the value of the resistance with your equation. So you have to have an external, you have to have an external power supply, and you have to measure the voltage and the current, do the division of those two things, and then get the resistance. Because there is no such way, uh, uh, in our practical world, to measure the resistance directly. So you have to have an external power supply for your resistance thermometer to work to be able to measure the resistance in the first place. But for a thermocouple thermometer, that is not required because it's the temperature difference that works as our energy source, which produces a EMF difference. So you don't need to buy batteries for a thermocouple thermometer because the temperature difference can work using a power source. So it's a built-in uh, advantage, whereas a resistance thermometer will always require a battery source. You have to replace it every once in a while. Okay, sir. My sound kind of cut down. Cut out in the middle, so no, that is fine. I'll just look up, look it up later in the video. <laughs> okay. So, Chris, thank you very much for today's class. For thank you for the additional two minutes of attention. Uh, we'll conclude for today. Uh, for today, and then uh, you have the rest of the problem. So get busy with them, and I'll start taking your homework responses uh, after a while. And I have almost uh, completed the uh, the updating with the part house services for for the addresses. So you might start receiving some. Uh, parcels hopefully within this week. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, but the moment we start dispersing those out, you'll be notified in the messenger group. So, yep, looking forward to better services. Thank you very much. Good night. Okay, sir. Thank you. <laughs>